Hello and welcome. You're watching Big Picture with me, Vishal Dahiya. And today we're going to talk about the issue of maritime security challenges. In fact, recently, Defence Minister Rajnath Singh had flagged India's concerns on maritime security in the Asian Defence Minister's meeting. Now, in ADMM Plus, Rajnath Singh called for a rule-based order for Indo-Pacific and also raised the issue of freedom of navigation in international waters, specifically South China Sea. Rajnath Singh also termed terrorism as the gravest threat to global peace and India also sought adherence to international rules and laws when it comes to traveling on uh, international waters and dealing in international waters is, is concerned. We'll try and understand all aspects of uh, the challenges in maritime security domain and uh, where does India stand, what exactly needs to be done and how are we going about it. And for more on this, we're joined by two distinguished experts today. Let me first introduce them to you, beginning with uh, retired Commander Abhijit Singh, who is uh, head of the Maritime Policy Initiative at ORF, is with us. And we're also joined by Mr. Ajay Banerjee, Defence Correspondent of the Tribune. Welcome, both of you gentlemen, to Big Picture. And let me start with you, Ajay. Let's start by looking at the highlights of uh, the ADMM Plus meeting where Rajnath Singh made uh, those significant comments with uh, the maritime security challenges. Well, Vishal, I will answer that in two parts. First, what uh, the Minister Rajnath Singh said at the ASEAN meet. First, the Minister said that it has to be an open Indo-Pacific free of any encumbrances. That means he was talking about the ongoing dispute which China has about claims in the South China Sea. Five other countries who are part of the ASEAN are involved in that dispute. China, I must remind our viewers, has lost its case in the UN uh, Convention of Laws at Sea. That's called the UNCLOS. It has raised another dispute and there is a code of negotiations going on. Sorry, a code of conduct negotiations going on between the five other countries and China. That code of conduct negotiations are going on at a very slow pace. That is the background. Uh, Mr. Rajnath Singh was very categorical that though he did not name China, he was very categorical that where he was coming from. He also made it very clear that he was talking about the South China Sea and the aspects which are going on, freedom of navigation and overflight over the South China Sea. Keep in mind, Vishal, your viewers must be aware that uh, the South China Sea is very rich in hydrocarbons, oil and gas. As I uh, bring you to the next part of it, uh, this is the second time China has been uh, China has been given a lowdown on the South China Sea and the freedom of navigation part. At mm -hmm. the G7, just on the 30th of June, there was a, a two-paragraph reference to the South China Sea, freedom of navigation, and overflight. The ASEAN also is discussing the same things with Mr. Rajnath Singh spoke yesterday. Is also discussing the same things. The ADMM Plus is actually the ASEAN Plus the ministers, defense ministers of a few other countries. The ADMM, that is the ASEAN Defense Minister's meeting, was conducted also uh, a couple of months ago, and that also was had spoken about the same thing, which is about overflight and freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. Vishal? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Let me bring in, uh, uh, you know, Kamara Abhijit here. Uh, Kamara Abhijit, you know, if we have to look at this issue, specifically India has been saying this time and again about... Uh, free and open, uh, you know, uh, Indo-Pacific. And uh, this time around, uh, uh, once again, as uh, Ajay was uh, saying, that uh, India has raised the issue of uh, South China Sea specifically, and that too in uh, the, uh, you know, in, in the presence of Chinese defense minister there as well. And uh, specifically, those other nations which were present, they're also affected by the same thing. Well, I would agree. Uh, you know, Rajnath Singh's flagging of the South China Sea conflict at the ADMM Plus uh, is indeed significant. Uh, uh, I think uh, this is the first time that a uh, defense minister has uh, brought this up in such frontal fashion. Though uh, it could be said that, you know, even in the past, uh, our position on the South China Sea has been stated by senior functionaries, including, I remember, in 2012, uh, then Foreign Minister Mr. S. N. Krishna had spoken about it a um, couple of years ago, I think it was 2016 or maybe 2017, when General V. K. Singh, when he was a uh, Minister of State in the Foreign Ministry, he brought this issue up. Uh, but these were standalone statements. And the fact that um, present uh, Raksha Mantri, Mr. Rajnath Singh, has brought this up at an ADMM Plus meet, which is, by the way, a very high-level meeting of defense ministers, 
goes to show that um, India does want to make its stand on the South China Sea very clear and at the highest levels. Mm -hmm. But I'm still going to say that uh, China is going to take this with a grain of salt. In fact, uh, there, there will be some in the Chinese system who will not sort of pay too much attention to what India has to say on this matter. Mm -hmm. And I say that for two reasons. One is that at this given moment, we have a live, I wouldn't say a live conflict, but we have an ongoing uh, situation on the Ladakh border. And uh, China knows that at a time when, you know, these negotiations are on, India will try and signal to China that it's not happy with what's happening there. And at the moment, there is a sort of a consensus within, between the two countries that we will not cross each other's red lines at sea. Uh, but this may be a sign that India will try and, you know, uh, if not open up another front, but still try and put pressure on the maritime side. But okay. I don't think that's going to make so much of a difference because the Chinese know that uh, uh, apart from making statements, the Indians haven't really shown an appetite to actually expand their deployments in the South China Sea. They're really worried about uh, the U.S. and other uh, big players, you know, such as Japan, Australia, Indonesia, some of the other countries in the uh, in in uh, Southeast Asia, and they're really looking at what these countries are doing in that region. So, as I, as I said, I mean, uh, it is a signal to China, but I don't think the Chinese are going to get excessively worked up about what is happening, um, what what sort of language India is using about this. Uh, it, it is a subtle cautionary to them. Okay. Um, and, and, and really the key marker, if I can sort of just bring this here, is, is that uh, for, for them is really going to be that, uh, uh, that, you know, what is India going to do with the Quad? And this is, I mean, I, I understand this is an issue that you might like to bring up later, but they're going to be watching what what is India going to be in, uh, do in concert with the other countries? So far, we have said that you know we are we are going to have a sort of an inclusive uh, policy with regard to Indo-Pacific Quad, etc. But they're going to be very watching us very closely about what our moves are going to be in concert with some of these other powers and what we are in concert going to be doing with them. Not so much in the Indian Ocean, but in the Pacific. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's let's look at that aspect uh, which you which you're flagging, uh, Kamran Abhijit, and. Uh, you know, China's aggressive behavior in uh, the critical sea lanes in South China Sea is obviously at, at the center of this entire maritime security uh, challenge. Uh, Ajay, you know, uh, you mentioned earlier how uh, there's a statement which came in from G7 as well. There's a negotiation which is going on uh, in terms of uh, how, you know, the, the, the rule of conduct uh, behavior there. But if we have to look at uh, this aspect which Commander Abhijit is pointing out, as in a concerted effort from all those who are involved, from all those who are affected by it per se, uh, the Quad grouping as well as the G7 and uh, the ASEAN uh, nations as well. Where, where do we stand in terms of the steps being taken or efforts being made by the partner countries there? Uh, see, Vishal, there are multiple things you have asked. First of all, I will remind you viewers that uh, the NATO allies are also at the moment not very happy with China. They are very clear that China is breaking the international code of conduct or the rule, the established global commons or the established global rules, which are already established. Mm -hmm. The NATO is not NATO ha not happy with it. The Quad, which is India, Australia, Japan, and the US are just building up. Australia and Japan issued a joint statement a uh, couple of, uh, I think last week, in which they said that uh, China was a threat to them. China actually threatened Australia with a missile strike. And China, Australia is also hinting to give away the, remove the Chinese from the Darwin base. They had given away a commercial shipping center at Darwin, which probably China will be ejected from that place in the northern part of Australia. Now, China is also a big trading partner of Australia and also of Japan. The Japanese, a lot of Japanese industries have their bases, manufacturing bases out there in China. They are still economically linked. A lot of U.S. industries linked to uh, Chinese the global raw materials and also the supply chains. Uh, I don't know if they can break those supply chains or no, but at the moment, the European nations, the Quad, India, Australia, Japan, U.S., and even the U.K., they have turned around and are now calling China a threat to global peace and security. That is a very big change that has happened. Uh, if you read the statements emerging from U.K. also in the past one month, Mm -hmm. They have changed their course vis-a-vis -vis China. And this is quite a change because just a couple of years ago, when uh, President Xi went to China, he was like fetid like a king out there with meeting the queen over lunch and tea and whatever. 
and uh, he was being splashed over all newspapers in in Britain out there. Today, for the uh, for the UK to turn around and say that China is a threat to uh, global stability and peace is very important. And also keep in mind the largest aircraft carrier of the U UK, the Queen Elizabeth, is making way towards the South China Sea deployment. It'll probably be another month or so. It'll be in South China Sea. It'll go past India too, and that is very important because uh, this will be for the one of the few deployments. Uh, in the past a few decades that the mm -hmm. UK is making east of the Swiss Canal. Indeed. Which itself is important because UK is an important partner with the US and it flies almost common uh, aircraft, common common surveillance planes. It is almost common in all technologies with the US. That is very important globally. We must see that, Vishal. Okay. Okay. Come on, Abhijit. You know, if, if you have to take into consideration all these aspects, uh, specifically the way, uh, you know, these nations uh, and these groupings are reacting, obviously, Economic uh, reasons are uh, there. They, they still exist, as Ajay was pointing out. Several of uh, these nations do have close, uh, uh, you know, uh, economic uh, relations with China, uh, dependent uh, both ways. But then the kind of stance which has been taken by NATO allies, by Japan, by Australia, and uh, you know, the, the way statements are coming in, the way positioning and repositioning is happening. How do you see, you know, this? Uh, uh, sort of having an effect on the way China behaves in South China Sea, one. And two, how significant uh, this stance is, and is this enough, or, or a lot more will have to be done? Well, uh, you know, how the uh, big powers in the West are framing this is that this is basically, uh, re, you know, rule-following democracies against rule-breaking authoritarian systems. So, uh, so at the G7 summit, um, there was a lot on the agenda, first of all. Uh, but the thrust of what the leaders were saying was that, um, that China needed to be brought to heel mm -hmm. in that meeting, as it probably did in the foreign ministers' meet about a month back, uh, the G7 foreign ministers' meeting. And uh, one of the reasons for that is the, that there are two aspects to the problem that big nations are facing. On the one hand is Chinese military aggression. And a military aggression, uh, not just in the South China Sea, but with regard to, especially with regard to Taiwan. So they're all watching what the, the Chinese are going to do with Taiwan. That question has become very urgent. Just in the past few weeks, there have been a number of aircraft incursions in Taiwanese air, airspace. These are Chinese fighter jets, their incursions into that space. So there's a sense that China is applying some pressure for you know, what it calls reunification, but is actually a forcible capture of uh, or takeover of, uh, of Taiwan. So they're looking at that question, uh, that aspect very closely. But the focus really of G7 at this moment is the global recovery. What they're keen to do actually is compete with China, not just counter China. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you find that there's a lot of discussion that's happening on issues like vaccines, on infrastructure, on trade, on technology. And India, by the way, isn't actually so much forward leaning on the South China Sea disputes, as it were. Our conversations also with partnerships are exactly in these areas. You know, we want resilient supply chains. We want a high tech partnership with the US and with the UK and some others. And we are talking about vaccines. Uh, big Build Back Better was a big infrastructure um, uh, initiative that, that came up this time in the, in the G7. So the focus really is not so much on conflicts. And the reason for that is that we are going through what's now being called and recognized as a global recession. China mm -hmm. has rebounded. And China is now in a, in, a, um, in a sweet spot. But the rest of the global uh, economy is going through a really hard time. Okay. So a lot of these are looking at uh, regaining, you know, starting the, um, giving momentum to that, to the growth engine, global growth engine. And so I think they are not so frontally keen to bring up the South China Sea challenges, even though I would completely agree with Ajay, it is really the focal point of U.S. attention. It's just that they are going, the U.S. is finding it hard to develop that kind of consensus among the other countries to go hard at China. So my opinion, opinion on this, or my view on this is that um, the, the South China Sea remains a critical aspect of that discussion, larger discussion. But at this given moment, a lot of countries, including India, are not so keen to put it on the, on the front burner, as it were, because okay. there's so many other issues, issues at play at the moment. Okay. Okay. Ajay, do you agree with the, what uh, you know? Uh, Kaman Abhijit is saying there that uh, uh, if if you look at uh, the uh, way the or the approach which has been taken by the world powers, uh, 
uh, specifically the G7 member nations, the NATO allies, uh, US and others, uh, uh, including United Kingdom, is, is, is an approach of, uh, uh, you know, competing with China rather than countering China because uh, it's the time where uh, these uh, powers will have to make themselves relevant in the region and then perhaps uh, take a countering approach there. Vishal, I will answer this with two references. First, when uh, President Biden took over, he held his first press conference end of February this year, and he said that China will have to pay for its misadventures, something like something to that effect. And China is now listed as uh, one of the key pacing challenges to the U.S. The U.S. has come out with a detailed document on China. The U.S. Defense Secretary General uh, Lloyd has come out with a directive on China, which is very clear that China has to be what the U.S. has to do with China, which includes ramping up infrastructure, military intelligence. The uh, U.S. has also come out with the Pacific Deterrence Initiative. It's a mm -hmm. $5.1 fund, which they have coming in the next budget. It will go only at creating infrastructure in the Pacific uh, region. $5.1 is a big money, actually around 35,000, 40,000 crore rupees, to put it in perspective. Now, now comes the part what U.S. will do with China. The U.S. has to outpace China. There is no other way out, even globally. U.S. is a democracy. We must all accept as a democracy. U.S. is a democracy. China is not a democracy. China is a conglomeration of dictatorship, which is imposed itself on Tibet, on Xinjiang, and on other places, and trying now in Taiwan, as Commodore Rajit pointed out. We face a big challenge from China in Ladakh, in Arunachal Pradesh, and so several smaller countries, even Bhutan, faces a challenge. Mm -hmm. What the U.S. will come out and do is the new policies which are speaking are of very great importance. What Biden has spoken, what uh, General Lloyd has spoken, and keep in mind, yesterday at Switzerland, where uh, President Biden and President Vladimir Putin of Russia met, uh, if you read between the lines, Russia is also hedging its bets against Chinese because Russia also feels that the Chinese can turn around and hit them because the Chinese economy, the way it is growing, will also decrease the Russian influence in Central Asia. Russia has the iron hold in Central Asia. The okay. Chinese economy can cause that iron hold to break. So I would I would still to come out with the context of the yesterday's meeting between Biden and Putin. That I think yes to yet to come out actually what does it mean? That will also result in a lot of things, Vishal. Okay. Okay. Let's now uh, quickly, you know, uh, one a final question to both of you. And let me start with uh, Kamana Abhijit here. Vis a vis the maritime security challenge from Indian perspective here, because India has time and again said that it 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 wants the rule based order to be followed in Indo Pacific uh, and and respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity and uh, of course, you know, uh, following international rules and laws there. So from India's perspective, uh, Kamana Abhijit, if we have to look at the challenges uh, in in the maritime time security domain and the way we are tackling them. Are we on the right path? Rishal, I'd say that, you know, this 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 vocabulary about uh, rules-based order has now actually become part of that maritime grammar. Um, everyone frequently uses rules-based orders, but we really, we have little sense of what exactly those rules are and how are we really going to um, implement those rules? Um, how do we make sure that that rule-based order is implemented? Mm -hmm. But what I go uh, sort of, uh, what I point out is that one of the ways to understand this is to actually compare the Chinese strategy in the wider region. China does not call it the Indo-Pacific region, but it does recognize that the Indian Ocean and the Pacific are both theaters of interest. If you compare the Chinese strategy with, say, the Indian strategy, what, what, uh, what are the conclusions that we can draw out of it? So on the Chinese side, it's very interesting. The Chinese actually have two different strategies for Indian Ocean and the Pacific. Mm -hmm. In the Pacific, especially the Western Pacific, which is really a theater of Chinese interest, is their inner circle, the core of their interests. They have what they call a full spectrum dominant strategy. That's where they like to use the force. That's where they use gray zone operations, you know, the terms like salami slicing, the incremental takeover of territory. That is a region that is really fraught as far as China is concerned. In the Indian Ocean, what they like to follow is they, they call it, uh, they call it stakeholdership. I call it incremental stakeholdership. So they're gradually in, uh, increasing their presence, their, their leverage in this space. But they are not actually doing it only with military force. In fact, they're creating an organic need uh, through the Belt and Road Initiative for the Chinese military to be there. Uh -huh. So so, uh, uh, so, so they're actually keeping out of those regions that are sensitive to India. So you would, you don't find them operating very close to Indian waters, for example. Uh, on a, a, on a, that rare occasion, they'll be there in the Indian EZs, but nowhere close to territorial waters. They're not going to give us a chance actually to raise our, to raise the ante. Or, and if at all they do, they'll make sure that the onus of aggression actually lies on India and not on China. So it's a very different ball game 
for China in the Indian Ocean, and so is it for India. So for India to just say that we'll have a very uh, robust military strategy to counter China, I don't think is going to work. We'll have to marry that up with many other components. There has to be an infrastructure component in which we are, you know, we're, we're giving alternatives to other states to mm -hmm. um, sign up to a plan that we are going to come up with. There's going to be a, there has to be a technology side of it because the, Ch uh, the Chinese have proposed a whole uh, um, uh, cyber belt and road. Uh, or a digital belt and road, you know, so the, and that's exactly what we're doing. The other thing is that if you compare this with, say, the Indian strategy, our strategy for the Indo-Pacific is to basically project this very inclusive, uh, you know, consensual, uh, conciliatory uh, sort of a, um, uh, an approach or, or a mm -hmm. stance. So okay. we say that... Uh, we say that everyone should be uh, should be invited into the tent. Uh, and if, if, if you hear uh, Foreign Minister Jay Shankar speak, he'll say that we are not an Asian NATO. He talks about the Quad. We are completely inclusive. We have never said that we uh, uh, that we are going to fight China in any way. So on the one hand, we are trying to portray this impression that you know we we, we are offering pushback to China. On the other, we are trying to to create this impression that uh, we are not actually trying to create some kind of hurdles in, okay. in China to uh, cooperate in the region. So, um, uh, so, 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 so what you get really is a mixed bag uh, as far as India is concerned. And I would still say that, you know, one of the ways to do this is that in the Indian Ocean, India should maintain its preeminence, its assertiveness, uh, deter China from uh, operating in regions that are sensitive to us. But we absolutely need to tie up and sort of uh, cooperate with our partners to have a presence in the Pacific. Okay. Because that is the space where China is 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 uh, uh, greatly um, um, unstable, or it 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 has a high level of uh, of sensitivity. That's the re region that we should target uh, in our Indo-Pacific strategy. Okay, okay. So quite a lot of components out there which needs to be kept in mind. Uh, Ajay, your uh, concluding comments on the way India is approaching or dealing with the maritime security challenges here, and uh, what more needs to be done. Some suggestions coming in from Commander Abhijit there as well. See, I would see start looking at China first. We, our policy has to be maritime policy has to be married against China, mated against China. I will uh, inform my viewers: China is going to take over a port in Israel on the Mediterranean coast. The US is very angry with it. China has a port in Djibouti in Africa. China has a port in Pakistan at Gavadar, which is actually near Iran. And China has a Belt and Road Initiative, which connects all the area into Europe. Now you can imagine where our strategy comes, and China is into. Uh, some uh, ca literally capturing land in the east coast of Africa, uh, smaller countries, poorer countries, where it is capturing land, be it uh, in the islands or be it in the mainland Africa. That mm -hmm. is what they are doing at the moment. So Indian strategy will have to match, a lot, lot of money will have to go into this strategy because China is trying to make infrastructure, which is like a visible uh, effort which China is making in these countries in Africa. Now, if we have to match it, we have to match it. How far do we go to match it? That is our policy call. How much money can we spend on it? That again will depend on India. China has got very deep pockets. We all know that. Uh, by the way, I must remind your viewers that in, uh, we had a quad kind of exercise in Guam. Guam is a US base in Western Pacific. And China created quite a ruckus about that exercise. We did join the exercise. Mm -hmm. It was around six months ago. But again, uh, it is important for us to carry on giving these signals to China in the maritime domain. Uh, see, Chinese uh, Chinese nuclear, uh, nuclear policy has uh, been laid out by CIPRI just three days ago in a report that China will have around 8 to 10 nuclear uh, 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 submarines, which can fire 10,000 kilometer long missiles, which can travel okay. to 10,000 kilometers. This is the latest report come out of Stipri three days ago. Mm -hmm. And they also are going to develop a kind of a thing which is called uh, fire on warning. That means if they hear that somebody is firing at them, and they can strike that. Now, these fire on warning, these codes, these words, these the phrases have been invoked during the Cold War, when the US and the USSR used to aim missiles at each other. China is going to do that. So where do we come up? Uh, do we have a long-range submarine-launched uh, nuclear missile? Uh, we have a short-range missile. China has a missile which is 10,000 kilometers. We have to match that and match it quickly in okay. real time. That is what it should be, Vishal. Okay, okay. So there it is. Thank you so much, uh, Ajay Banerjee, as well as uh, Kamana Abhijit Singh uh, for uh, your views and insights on the issue of maritime security challenges and the way India is uh, tackling those challenges. Also, what needs to be done specifically with the Indo-Pacific and South China Sea out there. We'll come back again with a different topic. Till then, keep watching. Thank you.